Hello and welcome to the Cato Institute's book forum on the politics industry, how political innovation can break partisan gridlock and save our democracy by Catherine Gale and Michael Porter. My name is Walter Olson. I am a senior fellow at Cato's Robert A. Levy Center for Constitutional Studies. And I'd like to offer a word first about uh, the format today. Uh, we are streaming. Uh, this is an online event which is available through multiple platforms, uh, YouTube, uh, Twitter, Facebook, and others. And you can ask questions from the audience during the event uh, by using the hashtag uh, Cato Events. That's hashtag C-A-T-O-E-V-E-N-T-S. Uh, the questions will reach us and uh, we will have a, a public Q&A session uh, later in the program based on those questions. We'll start today by hearing from author and Catherine er, from hearing from author Catherine Gale and then commenters Elaine K. Mark and Andy Craig. And I will introduce all three of them uh, to start out with and then uh, hand the floor over to uh, Catherine Gale. Uh, she is uh, the author of The Politics Industry, which we'll be discussing today. Uh, she is a veteran of both private and public centers. She is the former president of a uh, $250 million a year uh, food company in Wisconsin, which she sold in uh, 2015. She has served on the board of the federal government's Overseas Private Investment Corporation and on many nonprofit boards. And she is the founder of the Institute for Political Innovation, founded in 2020 to catalyze political change in America. Our first comments will be from uh, Elaine Kamrock, uh, uh, who is a uh, friend of Cato's, I believe, from earlier events and a senior fellow at the uh, Brookings Institution in its governance studies program. She's also the director of the Center for Effective Public Management at Brookings, a well-known expert on American electoral politics and government, uh, author of quite a few books, including uh, Primary Politics, Everything You Need to Know About How America Nominates Its Presidential Candidates, and uh, uh, she is a lecturer at the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard, uh, started there in 1997 after a career in politics. Uh, relevant for today, she has been a member of the Democratic National Committee and its Rules Committee since 1997. Uh, she has attended uh, uh, a whole bunch of like 10 nominating conventions, uh, some as participants, some uh, covering it and has served as a superdelegate to five democratic conventions. Uh, <clears throat> our second commenter will be Andy Craig, who is known to many of you at Cato. He is a staff writer for Cato, where he is assistant editor of our bi-monthly magazine, Cato Policy Report, quarterly publication, Cato's Letter, and Cato Audio, the Institute's monthly audio digest. And young though he is, he has had quite a career in electoral politics. Uh, having worked uh, for the presidential campaign of Gary Johnson and his running mate, Governor Bill Weld, one of the most successful third party presidential campaigns of modern times. And having also run for Secretary of State in his home state of Wisconsin, he did not, I believe, prevail. Um, so let me start by introducing uh, Catherine Gale um, to tell us about her book. Catherine. Walter. Thank you so much. And Andy and Elaine, it's a privilege to be with you guys today. And for all of those who have joined us, uh, thank you. I um, would like to begin by asking everybody to join me uh, in imagining. So go back and pretend that it is December of 2010. The national debt is $13.5 trillion, which now seems a long time ago, an acquaint number actually, but um, nonetheless, it's $13.5 trillion. And the bipartisan National Committee uh, Commission on Fiscal Responsibility, which you may recall as the Simpson-Bowles Commission, has just finished its work. Um, I actually have in front of me a pre the preamble that the of the committee's report, which I highlighted all that 10 years ago. And here's what the preamble says. None of us likes every element of our plan, and each of us has had to tolerate provisions we previously or presently oppose in order to reach a principled compromise. We were willing to put our differences aside to forge a plan because our nation will certainly be lost without one. 
Okay, so that's the scene you're imagining. And now imagine that you are a member of Congress at this time, and the Simpson Bowles plan advances to a vote, and you have to consider what you're going to do about this. Um, you might want to ask yourself, is this a good idea? Is this the best principled compromise that we can find, even though I may oppose certain things in it? Is this what the majority of my general election constituents want? But you don't ask yourself those questions because the only question that you can really afford to ask yourself is, will I win my next party primary if I vote for this? And if you're on the left, the answer is no, because that compromise, that principled compromise includes some reduction in entitlements. And if you're on the right, the answer is no, because that principled compromise includes some tax increases to balance it out. So on both sides, you cannot vote for the principled compromise. And by the way, this challenge of how to vote is the same challenge and question that all of our Congress people have to ask themselves for all the major challenges facing our country, immigration, infrastructure, healthcare, national security, neither side can vote yes, because consensus solutions don't win party primaries. It doesn't matter what you really think or what the country really needs, because in most cases, the rational incentive to get reelected really restricts your options and dictates that you vote no. Now, if you do decide to go for it anyway, you will be threatened with a primary because right about the same time as Simpson Bowles Commission, a primary ceased to be just a noun as in the primary, and it became a verb to primary as in we're going to primary you further to your right if you're a Republican, further to your left if you're a Democrat, if you do not adhere to um, what we want on this side and this side. Party primaries are the, or I say the, I could even, I could say one of the, but I'll just go with the driving force of dysfunction in DC because they forbid the two sides or even Republicans alone or Democrats alone to deal powerfully with complex trade-offs that are inherent to the serious policy challenges that we have. They forbid the two sides to negotiate a, a consensus solution. And in what we would call unified government, they actually push the party that's in charge to pay extra attention to, to their wings, their primary voters. Congress does what wins primaries. Gridlock, grandstanding, and demonizing the other side and one-sided proposals win primaries. And that's why one of the key reasons why 11 years later, our debt is now um, 100, uh, 29 trillion. Which brings me to a quote from Mickey Edwards, who's a former Republican congressman from Oklahoma and now teaches at Princeton, uh, which really turned the light on for me a number of years ago. He said, Congress isn't broken, it's doing what it's designed to do. And that was just this light bulb moment for me. So if you think about it, in any human endeavor, the rules of the game affect the way the game is played and affect the outcome of that game. And the fact is that the rules of the game in politics, not, not the ones you know, in the Constitution, which is only this short, but the rules that we've made up of how our democracy is going to function day to day, how our elections function, uh, these rules are at the core of our political problems. There isn't a change candidate that can save us because the rules are incenting what we're getting. We have a systems problem. We have a design problem. And that's what the book really gets at. So I'd like to show you this design flaw as I showed in the book with a Venn diagram. And this is a non-intersecting Venn diagram. In the current system, and the slide will probably come up. If it doesn't, I will do it with my hands. So in the current system, there is no connection between Congress acting in the broad public interest and the likelihood that they will get reelected. As we just illustrated, one of the rules about how Congress gets and keeps their jobs is this huge problem. Oh, here's my Venn diagram. Okay, see, there's no connection between acting in the public interest, doing what we need, and the likelihood that people will get reelected. So I want to look a little bit deeper at this problem of party primaries as the cause of that no connection. They aren't party primaries aren't a problem theoretically. They're a problem because right now in the United States, they're the only elections that matter for federal and House 
races for federal House and Senate races, I should say. So over 80% of elections are decided in the primary months and months before November. In a safe red district, you know that the person who won that Republican primary is already guaranteed to win in November and the same reverse in blue districts. This means that eight out of a 10 general elections for Congress have zero impact. Their votes in our democracy are essentially meaningless. And here's the thing, only 10% of eligible voters turn out for the party primaries that determine who does win, which means that only 10% of voters really have a great deal of say over what we're going to get done or not. I have a four-year-old son, so sometimes I think of this as um, sort of like those 10% of voters being the boss of us. That's a big theme in my house right now with a four-year-old. Um, now, even though we really think that the 10% on this side and on this side could not be more different than from each other. They actually have one really key characteristic that defines them and that they have in common, which is to say these 10% slices dislike, perhaps even hate the other party more than they positively, affirmatively like any particular ideology. As political scientist Lee Drutman noted in a report earlier last year, earlier this year, given that growing research indicates that negative partisanship, this dislike of the out party is more significant than ideological polarization. This may be the main differentiator between those primary voters and the general election voters. And since those 10% are the only ones with power, it's really become systemically impossible or super challenging for Congress to do what needs doing. So think about it in your own organizations where you work every day. If you wanted to solve your biggest problems, I suspect that there's one thing you definitely wouldn't do, which is bring everybody together in a room and then say, okay, we're gonna deal with these huge issues that we all care deeply about. But first, before we get started, let's count off by twos and we'll divide into warring teams and then we'll get right to work. But effectively, that's the system that is created every day in Washington, DC. So I wanna uh, bring up that Venn diagram again and say it more plainly. If America's representatives in our current election system do their jobs the way we need them to as a country, which is to do the complex work of legislating and deal making, they're likely to lose those jobs. And that's, absolutely crazy. But here's what else is crazy. Politics is the only industry in our country of free markets, capitalism and democracy, where we are regularly told that less competition is better for the customer. And if there's never any new competition, then our elected officials aren't actually accountable to us for results because they don't need us to like what they're doing. They only need us to choose them as the lesser of two evils or to just stay home. Now, I want to be clear, and, and that's un uniquely anti-competitive industry. Now, I want to be clear about a couple of things before we get to the solution to these challenges that I'm, these systemic challenges I'm raising. One is there is absolutely nothing inherently wrong with quote unquote extreme views on whatever multiple dimensions you could have views that are not part of the generally accepted uh, current middle. Ideological diversity, absolute, and all kinds of diversity must be valued and protected in a democracy. Look, some people would consider Cato's libertarianism to be an extreme view. Um, in any human endeavor, innovation almost always arises at what are considered fringes, okay? It doesn't arise and progress out of necessarily a squishy middle of current, of current view. So our problem is not that, you know, there's a certain extreme, that's not our systemic problem. Our systemic problem is that it is only those extremes that have the power over our agenda in Congress. Second, our systemic problem is not the Democrats or the Republicans. It's certainly not parties. I actually favor very strong parties, stronger than we have now. Um, there's not even anything wrong with having only two parties. The problem that we have is that the current two are guaranteed to be the only two ongoingly, regardless of what they do or don't get done on behalf of the citizens. 
So if you think about it for a moment in any other industry that is sort of as big and as thriving as politics with only two companies and over 80% of customers are dissatisfied with both of those, some entrepreneur would see it as a phenomenal business opportunity and they would enter the market to give the consumer what they want. And they would either win in the marketplace or they would push the current two companies to do better such that they would win. It is that competition that drives progress on behalf of the sort of quote unquote customers in that industry. But that kind of new competition never happens in politics. And that is also because of the rules of the game in elections. Fortunately, we can fix both of these problems of the rules of the game in elections. The fact that we have party primaries forbidding the sides to work powerfully together and the fact that we don't have any healthy competition. The political innovation that I propose in the book with my co-author Michael Porter of Harvard Business School is called Final Five Voting. And it solves for these two design flaws and it's designed to fundamentally change the incentives that drive the behavior in Washington, DC. Unlike a political reform, Final Five Voting, I talk about it as a political innovation. Um, it's not a Trojan horse for partisan advantage. It's about changing the system underneath, um, underneath all the parties and players. Final Five Voting is therefore not necessarily designed to or going to change who wins. It's designed to change what the winners have the freedom to do, are incented to do, and on whose behalf they're doing it. So with Final Five voting, we make two simple changes to our elections for Congress. Change number one is we get rid of party primaries. Instead, we just have a primary. There's only one ballot and every candidate, no matter their party, Greens, Democrats, Republicans, Libertarians, um, Independents, every candidate running in the primary appears on one ballot and you go in, vote for your favorite, polls close, count all the votes, and this time the top five finishers will advance to the general election, not just one Democrat, one Republican. And now we do not, no matter how red or blue a district is, we don't know who's won. When the primary is over, we do not know. The election will be decided in the general. So now between the primary and the general with five candidates, we're going to benefit from really this dynamic, diverse competition of ideas, policies, visions, um, candidacies. And then in the general, we need to decide who wins. Now, this isn't quite as straightforward as we would think, because now that we have the benefits of this healthy competition of five, we wouldn't want to almost accidentally elect one of those five with only 21% of the vote, which could happen if the vote split relatively equally five ways. We need to figure out which of the five has the greatest support of the majority of general election voters. And so change number two of final five voting solves that problem. We're going to get rid of plurality voting which is where, what we have in the US now, where the person with the most votes wins, whether or not they have a true majority. Instead, we'll implement a system called instant runoff voting. Some of you may be familiar with this system as something called ranked choice voting. There are reasons why it's better to call it instant runoff voting, but we don't need to go into those. So let me explain instant runoff voting. Under instant runoff voting, when you vote in November, your ballot has five candidates and that's going to come up here. You pick your favorite of these five candidates, just like always. And then if you want to, you can also indicate your second choice. I don't know why the ballot's not coming up. Let me describe it for you. Uh, a ballot has the five candidates and across the top, it says first choice, second choice, third choice, fourth, fifth, and you fill in a little bubble for each one of your choices. So I fill in the bubble for my first choice, who is Elaine. And then Andy is my second choice. And I fill in that bubble. Walter is my third choice. And all the way down to that Catherine Gale, and she is my fifth choice, my last choice over my dead body. Do I want her to be elected? You can rank as many or as few as you want. Oh, here you go. Alexander Hamilton is actually my first choice. And John Adams is my over my dead body. Do I want John Adams to win? Now, 
the polls close, and the ballot counting technology enables a series of instant runoff rounds. The first choice votes are counted, and then the candidates are in an order one to five. The candidate who's in last place, fifth place, is automatically eliminated. And if you had selected that candidate who's now out of the race, your single vote is automatically transferred to your next choice of the remaining four. Then we count the votes again, and who's ever in last place is eliminated. And voters who had selected that candidate have their vote automatically transferred to who is remaining in the race. So that is how the instant runoff rounds move forward until we get to the final two, in which case one of those final two will have majority support. They will have the greatest support of the broadest you know, number of people uh, in that electorate. It's exactly like a series of physical runoffs, but instead of having to keep showing up again at the polls for another election, you simply cast all your votes at once. So let me summarize the solution. Final five voting is the combination of these two changes. First, top five primaries. Second, instant runoff voting in the general election. You put those together and the system's called final five voting. Now remember, it's not designed to change who wins. It doesn't make blue districts red or red districts blue, but it does change what the winners have the freedom to do and are incented to do. So think of it this way. Let's go back to that example we had at the beginning where I asked you to imagine yourself as a congressperson. You couldn't vote yes on the consensus bipartisan legislation like Simpson Bowles, even if you believed it was the best slash most achievable way forward for the country and your constituents. But now it's your same person, same views, same bill, same, same district. But with these new incentives of final five voting, it's a different story. You can vote yes if you want to. You can make this calculus. Well, under the old system, I never would have made it back through my party primary if I voted for this. But under the new system, I don't answer only to them. I answer to the general election. And I'm the incumbent. I know I will be in the top five out of that primary. And then in the general election, with a combination of first, second, third choice votes, I can craft a win. So now I have options I didn't have under the previous system. So we take a look at our original Venn diagram. Final five voting has created the intersection that we need so that our Congress people have the freedom to and are incented to do that complex work of legislating. And the reason they can do it is because that's now the new best way to get reelected. Final five voting frees our legislators from what I call the tyranny of the party primary. They have this freedom to innovate, to lead, to think independently, to reach across the aisle whenever it's helpful, to negotiate, to make deals. Instead of gridlock and grandstanding, they can deliver solutions if they'd like to. And if they don't, they'll now be pretty much guaranteed new and healthy competition in the next election because one of those five candidates will be able to mount a legitimate challenge to put pressure on them to deliver the solutions or hold them accountable in a way that the marketplace does when you have healthy competition. In effect, final five voting does something really interesting. It makes politicians both more free while also making them more accountable, but accountable in elections to the general electorate. And I call this dynamic free market politics because it delivers the best of what healthy competition delivers in any industry, innovation, results, and accountability. And what I think is amazing, and, and thank goodness, is that Article One in the Constitution, I'm always carrying around my pocket Constitution when I, when I talk about this, um, Article One gives each state the power to make these rules of election for Congress anytime. So each state can change it. Our, our constitution gives us that power and therefore I think the responsibility to remake our political system when we need to. So that's, the, uh, that's a key part of the book. And 
The proposed solution, final five voting, is what I'm pretty much uh, working on full time right now. I can't wait until I can get to my next proposed solution in the book. But um, for now, I'm like a, a one a one horse uh, competitor, and I'm all in for final five voting. And I'm so thrilled to have been able to chat with you about that, and look forward to also having the conversation now with Andy and Elaine. Thank you. Thank you so much. Now we'll hear from Elaine K. Mark. Good. Um, let's see, am I, can you hear me? Good. Can everyone hear me? Yep, you're good. Indeed. Okay, good. Okay. Um, listen, Catherine, I'm delighted to be here. Uh, you have really nailed it in terms of the analysis. I mean, what really is the problem in American politics today is primaries and the fear of being primaried. It is responsible for a lot of dysfunction in the Congress and in the Senate. Um, and it is a something that we really need to figure out how to how to get around. The, the primary system has always failed us in the when it was invented in the early uh, 1900s. It was supposed to be a way to kill political machines. Political machines got around it. It didn't work. Okay, political machines thrived right up until 1972 um, when primaries be finally became very, very strong, at least at, especially in the presidential nominating system. So the primary system is very problematic. Um, and it does lead to people taking extreme views. It does inhibit, inhibit compromise. Um, but let me go to, uh, let me do a, a, a couple little subtleties here, okay, that I think are, are important. Um, first of all, the interesting thing is we've, we've, at Brookings, we've done three studies on people who run in congressional primaries. We did it in 14, 16, 18, and then there, and someone else did it in 2020, so four altogether. Um, the interesting thing is that if you look at the challengers, because the incumbents win for a variety of reasons, if you look at the challengers in both political parties, the moderates win more often than win their primaries more often than the extremes do. Among the Democrats in 2018, the establishment challengers won primaries 35% of the time. The left wing challengers won them 26% of the time. In, among the Republicans, the establishment candidates won 40% of the time, and conservatives won 24% of the time. So the the sort of press impression that's out there that the primaries always give us extreme candidates is a little bit more nuanced okay nonetheless catherine's exactly right the can the congress people themselves don't care about this data they don't care about this they are afraid of being primary they are afraid of being one of the ones that gets bumped off in a primary from one of their extremes so the impact on congressional decision making is actually quite enormous um, even though it doesn't fit the facts as neatly as people think it would um, secondly uh i worry about the getting I, I worry not about the ranked choice voting i like ranked choice voting i think instant runoff voting could be a really good innovation in american politics what i worry about is putting both political parties into a primary and having a completely nonpartisan primary and what i worry about there is that it will parties are extraordinarily important to democratic systems, even though everybody always hates them. And, and we come by that honestly, Jefferson, Adams, and Washington all hated, as you point out in the beginning of your book, Catherine, they all hated primaries. And yet who formed the first political uh, primary political system? It was Jefferson and Adams, okay? And that system has basically existed to this day. Jefferson's, I just, did a book review of a book on the history of the Democratic Party, and it's the oldest party in the world. Um, they, those primaries are important. I mean, parties are important because they organize political space for voters who don't necessarily have the time to go through and organize political space for themselves. 
So if basically you kind of don't like government very much, you'd like to see lower taxes, you are pro-life, you're not wild about this, a lot of social welfare spending, you know, if you kind of got that, that basket of feelings about politics, you're going to vote Republican. If you think government should get more active in solving problems, you think taxation should be progressive and rich people should pay taxes and you're pro-choice and you think that government should do more to help the poor, you're a Democrat. Okay, those are the big rough things. What worries me about lumping everybody together in the primary is what does it do to the definition of party? How does it blur? right, the, what the meaning of party is. And the meaning of party is extremely important to voters because they don't read position papers and they're not gonna read position papers, okay? But they wanna know a general approach to politics that, they, that the parties give them. So, so my, my caveat here is that I think that the lumping uh, the parties together in one primary could weaken what parties do in a democracy. Now, with that, let me end with two sort of suggestions that I think are in the same spirit as Catherine's suggestions, okay? One is to have a national primary day. Two different elections, one for Democrats, one for Republicans, but have all the congressional primaries be on one day. The reason this is important is that the reason congressional primary turnout is so low is that the primary congressional primaries begin in March and go all the way into September. And many of them occur in August. I know this because many of my summers have been ruined by coding, <laughs> coding congressional candidates. Um, many of them happen, it, it, they're designed, they're placed where they are to be obscure. They are designed for obscurity. They're designed to not get voters engaged. Whereas if you had a national primary for the Democrats, you would have voters would get what the divisions are within the Democrats and what they should be, what they're fighting over, uh, Medicare for all, et cetera, et cetera, which by the way, was not very popular in the 2018 uh, Democratic primaries, which again is kind of against the grain, against the conventional wisdom. Um, Republicans would then be able to fight out what they're fighting for. And the voters by choosing, by seeing this in the internal fight would get to have a clear idea of what their party is generally about in both its factions. And then the second innovation that I would I, I would suggest for that's also kind of in the lines in the line of Catherine's um, where Catherine's going is that we could change the um, number that it takes to elect a Speaker of the House. Right now, that is a small majority, which means that the, uh, the, the nomination, so to speak, for Speaker comes from the caucus itself. The caucus itself generally is loaded on the left or on the right, as, as Catherine pointed out. Um, and therefore, you, you, get a, you get speakers who are beholden to that caucus. What if you moved that, say, to a three-fifths vote for speaker? If you moved it to a three-fifths vote, then, Demo first of all, you could imagine, even, even, in, even in this Congress where there's very, very few moderates, you could imagine that the moderates in both parties would, would control, okay? You'd have to get a, a, candidate, a successful Democratic candidate for speaker would have to get some Republicans. A successful Republican for speaker would have to get some Democrats, unless of course it was a landslide election, congressional election, which we, we have from time to time, 1932, 36, and 64, but you know we don't have it very often. Um, and that would then create in the leadership a this that they would then have a governing coalition and that coalition would be enough to really pass some things because they would have formed that coalition in the course of forming their leadership so um those are two other ideas that i would have to to break this um unfortunate situation we're in 
one final point, I know I said a final point a minute ago, but one final point is that um, the primary system isn't the only um, part of the system that is really causing dysfunction. We are in a peculiar situation, and unfortunately, this situation was created by the founding fathers in the Constitution. The fact that every state has two senators is vastly distorting. So we now have a country where minority, a minority can rule the majority. And I don't think they ever thought that would happen. Nobody ever thought that was going to happen. But we have a situation where three, three votes in the Congress, two senators and one congressman from Wyoming or from Delaware have vastly more political power than the Congress people and senators from California or Texas. Um, this is distorted. Um, it's because of the way the population has moved. We don't, because of the way we live these days and because of you know mechanized agriculture and all that stuff, I don't think we're going back anytime soon to a more even distribution of the population across the country. And so we're, we're in a very dangerous situation that the very legitimacy of the nation is undermined by the fact that fewer voters can in fact control the national government. We've seen this a couple times already where more voters vote for Democrats in the House elections but Republicans win the most elections because not only is the Senate a problem, but the Constitution says that every um, every um, state has to have at least one member of Congress. So that's a, that's a big, big problem. And I don't think the founders ever anticipated we would have this weird coast heavy country with with very few people in between but the results for democracy are incredibly dangerous so i would add those two things to your reform agenda catherine or your innovation agenda which i, I agree is better than reform and um turn it over to walter well thank you and i'm now going to in turn uh hand it over to andy craig okay now. Thanks. Uh, well, first, I just want to say I really enjoyed the book. Um, it is uh, well written. Um, it does a very good job covering the how and why of the two party system. Um, I think your analogy to a uh, an industry and an uncompetitive in industry that's been monopolized or duopolized um, is a very uh, helpful way to, to think about and discuss this problem. Um, you're seeing a rising sentiment uh, across the political spectrum. I think that polarization and the two party system, it, it's just, it's tearing us apart. Um, every election, it seems like it's getting ramped up to the, you know, every election is do or die. Um, every election we have to, to fight to the death. Um, and it's all a, a winner take all struggle for, for power, both at the presidential level and in, and in Congress. Um, so this book, this book does a very good job explaining that, um, it, it has some new insights for people who are, uh, already in the weeds of electoral reform ideas and, uh, kind of the growing movement for that, but also for, you know, if you're, you're just looking to pick up your first book on why things have gotten this bad, it's a good, good place to start. Um, so Catherine, you, you, you talk about innovation, um, and I think that's, that's an important way to look at it and, and. If you go all the way back, you know, in a sense, this is very Madisonian. This is what the founders were doing at Philadelphia. Um, and it go through all the way through to today, you know, here at Cato, we like public choice economics that um, analyzes the incentives of political actors as, as something subject to, you know, it's rational systemic incentives that produce the, the behavior and the outcomes. Um, and so I think by, by looking at it that way, you open up a lot of possibilities for different ideas. Um, and you, uh, your proposal is an interesting one, this, this final five voting with the, um, you know, what we might call a jungle primary um, and then having instant runoff in the general election. Uh, there are a lot of other ideas out there. Um, and I kind of, I, as part of encouraging innovation, I, I take very much a, all of the above approach 
One of the great things about federalism is we can have these laboratories of democracy. We can try different things, and some states and some cities already are. Um, but I looked into, uh, so you're in Wisconsin, and I know the final five proposal is under consideration there. Um, I went and looked at the last two U.S. House elections in Wisconsin, and only out of eight districts across two elections, so 16 races, uh, only one of them had more than five candidates running uh, in the primaries combined all together from all parties. And so, you know, on the on the details of the mechanics here, I am a little bit skeptical of whether it's necessary or even, you know, going to make much difference to have that primary where you winnow it down to five when in 90 percent plus of races up and down the ballot, there aren't more than five candidates running. Um so, you know, I think you could maybe just skip straight to straight to the ranked choice and it wouldn't wouldn't make a ton of difference. Um, might say might save taxpayers a little bit on running the primary. Um, but if we look overseas, um, you know, most liberal democracy, the United States is the only large liberal democracy that literally only has two parties represented in its national legislature. Um, it's it's very much an outlier. And if you look at the electoral systems that other countries do that produce more multi-party systems, uh, which I think have a lot to recommend them in terms of better representation and encourages uh, a deliberative process. People are, um, you know, have to come together in coalitions rather than kind of being forced into these two monolithic camps. Um, most of the, almost all of those use some kind of proportional representation um, instead of having, you know, just these single member districts. Um, and you mentioned Lee Drutman, who uh, also wrote an excellent book about, about this issue and, and has written for Cato about it. Um, and his proposal is, is to have multi-member districts uh, where you have proportional representation. So you would have like a five member district and you might end, depending on the voter outcome, you might end up with one libertarian, one Democrat, and three Republicans or something like that. But it lets political minorities still be represented in a way that the inherently winner-take-all nature of single-member districts doesn't. Um, so even if you have ranked choice voting uh, or if you have uh, nonpartisan primaries, all that, there's, there's something about single-member districts that I think does tend towards uh, a kind of a duopoly uh, system. There are uh, other reforms. You talk a little bit about Nebraska. And as Walter mentioned, I have some experience banging my head against the wall in third party politics. Uh, probably more of us at Cato than most uh, think tanks in DC have, have been down that road. And uh, it's just a, a bit of an anecdote about this Nebraska system. This is an example of a very old innovation. It goes back to the 1930s, but they have a unique system. It's the only state legislature in the country that's nonpartisan, both on the election side, so they don't even print party labels on the ballot, um, and on the internal rules side, the legislative machinery. And so uh, back in uh, around 2017, 2016, there was a uh, state senator, member of the legislature there, who switched parties. She had been a Republican. Uh, she became a libertarian over uh, the death penalty and some other issues where she was, uh, you know, in conflict with the Republican Party establishment there in the state. But after that happened, after she switched parties, you know, if you did that in Congress, you'd be persona non grata. You'd lose all your committee seats. Uh, you'd have next to no chance of getting reelected. Um, where, but in Nebraska, she was uh, first elected chair of the Judiciary Committee, uh, which is, you know, a big, powerful committee, but she was respected by her colleagues. And because it's nonpartisan rules, it wasn't determined by the party caucus. And she was able to pass um, a major occupational licensing uh, reform bill, which, you know, again, if you were if you were to buck the two parties, you would not be passing anything through Congress anytime soon. And. One thing that happened that I thought was really illustrative of the potential for reforms is she ran for re-election, uh, came up short, unfortunately, um, uh, but it was very competitive. 
um, she, uh, Laura Epke ended up with something in the, the mid forties. And I, I, at the same time I saw that, I saw in other states, you know, this happens from time to time, uh, other state representatives like in New Hampshire had switched parties, tried to run third party as incumbents for reelection. And they got in the single digits, um, even as incumbents. So I think there's a lot to be said for nonpartisan voting. Um, I think there's, you know, kind of at the other extreme, there's a lot to be said for proportional representation. But the bottom line is, it is important to innovate, to experiment. Um, we have this kind of idealized civics idea that elections reflect the will of the people, the electorate. But right now, we have a system where the two parties are not just reflecting the divisions in the electorate, they're causing it. They're fueling it. They're dividing us up into these two warring camps that is not necessarily a very natural division or something that's just inherent in, in the you know wide range of policy views that, that people have. Um, so I'm, I'm very much looking forward to it. I will say one other point about the book. You have some very good advice uh, about how to build coalitions. Uh, for reform in the states, how to who, who to go about, how to put together these cross-partisan groups, um, who are the different players you need to get involved. Um, you also have a very good idea on the legislative machinery side that, uh, and you point to some past examples of how Congress could kick this over to uh, an independent commission of some sort that could come up with a rules package that they could adopt because it's true, the congressional rules have a lot of accumulated detritus <laughs> over the years that needs to go. Um, Congress has not allowed an open rule vote on anything in years now. You can't introduce amendments. You know, everything is decided in a back door by a few party leaders uh, and the white, you know, people in the, the White House and the Senate and House majority and minority leaders, and then just shoved through on what's basically a party line rubber stamp vote. And that's not a legislative process. Um, that's not a process where outcomes can be discovered by the give and take of proposing and voting on amendments and, and perfecting something. And you see that in the, in the results. We don't get broad buy-in to major policy changes anymore. Um, for better, you know, for better and for worse, we, you know, uh, we're not necessarily huge fans of every big bill that comes down the pike, but it's worse when it goes through this process. And you know, from the national debt to healthcare to executive power and foreign policy, a lot of this is driven by that dysfunction in Congress. So I think I'll, I'll wrap it up with that. But I will say it's an excellent book. There's a lot, uh, there's a lot of good ideas here. Um, I would love to see Final Five uh, adopted in more states. And I would like to see uh, a bunch of states try all these, all these potential different ideas for reform. I'll hand it back over to Walter. Well, thank you, Andy. <clears throat> what I'd like to do now is to invite all three of you, but starting, of course, with Catherine Kale, to respond to uh, the other panelists um, and uh, turn it into a conversation. Thank you, Walter and Andy and Elaine. First of all, I, I'm just going to want to talk to you guys all day long and hear more of what you have to say. Um, I love it. Let me uh, give two quick, well, two responses. I don't know how quick. First is one of the things I noted is that the three of us all care very much about legislative machinery, meaning the rules and norms and processes of how the sausage gets made and the skewed incentives in that right now, as well as we care about the elections machinery. So the rules, norms, and processes of how we elect. And, and my book actually talks about both things. So one of my favorite ideas, Elaine, is your idea to require three-fifths election for this, you know, three-fifths vote to elect the Speaker of the House, because then they would need to answer to three-fifths, which likely would include some people of, quote, the other side. Super powerful in my, you know, estimation. Here's... Um, so I think that's interesting. Here's what I will give as my general comment. And if my colleague could pull up another Venn diagram, I sort of do that all the time. I'm a business person. I actually sold my company in 2015 so I could now do this political work full time. And 
I, of course, I'm not a political expert. I'm not a political scientist. I'm not any of those things. And so I did come to this theory of competition because of business, but I also came to um, a decision about focus because of business. So in in business, we have this saying, actually it's made famous, uh, it's a famous quote from my co-author, Michael Porter, strategies about choosing what not to do. So we constantly you know, have to choose what we're gonna invest in, which product, which service, et cetera. And that is what I had as my own personal orientation that I wanted to end, I wanted my book to be totally about action which is, although I agree there's lots of good ideas that we need to look at and lots of things we need to debate over time, I wanted a prescription for all the people who want to do something now and for the time crunch that I think we're under in terms of our democracy being under threat. So I use a spend diagram for that, which is essentially a rubric of deciding what we should do. The only things I want to recommend that the people spend their time on now are things that are at the intersection of being of powerful and achievable. And by powerful, that definition is that it, if this innovation were implemented or this reform, it would need to change the likelihood that Congress would deliver results in that broad public interest. And in my work, there's actually a definition of what results in the broad public interest are, but to do that. And then the second piece is uh, achievable. And achievable means that you have to get to the point where those results are coming in this new way in a matter of years, not decades. So what I've found is when I evaluate all the proposals that are out there, it's best to start with achievable because if we haven't implemented proposals, we're talking about theoretical, you know, and so, so whether something's powerful or not, we could have more debate on. So I start with achievable and it's, it's a brutal rubric because it means that a lot of potentially powerful ideas and ideas that seem super like sort of moral and, and right, et cetera, to a lot of people can't be considered in the, in the time frame I'm talking about. So here's what I, I mean. Constitutional amendments aren't currently achievable for the same reasons that we can't get anything else done, we're too divided. So whenever, and, and by the way, I think it's super important that people have this debate about our constitution and the electoral college and the two senators. We definitely need to be looking at all of those things. For my role in this book, changing any of that, if you could even get agreement on what would be powerful in the good way, you know, is not achievable because we're not gonna get any constitutional amendments done in years, not decades. So that's a no. Then I look at changing the number it takes to elect the Speaker of the House. And I'm not saying these, you know, like, let me say why this is all wrong. These are all these things that are super important and need to be considered. I'm just saying why I still come down to final five voting. We can't get people in the House to change the rules to elect the Speaker of the House unless they cannot be primaried and, you know, sort of that threat put on their heads by the current leadership who would not want those rules to be changed. So that's why I have come to the view that we have to change the elections machinery first, and then those people can have the freedom to make these changes in the legislative machinery. The third thing is, let's give, for example, the National Primary Day also, which I love, all the states would need to change that primary day individually which will take a huge amount of time and it has to truly be national to get the scope and the attention and everything that you're saying. And that just isn't likely to get 50 states to change that rule because of the powers that be there. Whereas for something like final five voting, which I'll get to, we only need to change it in five states to see the results. So it's all hard, but it's sort of which is less hard as in which is more achievable. So then we can't do that. And proportional representation, which yes, Lee Drutman writes powerfully about, as do you, Andy, um, in 1967, as of course you know, but telling the audience, Congress passed a law that mandated single house districts. So we can talk about proportional representation till we're blue in the face. And Congress is not going to get rid of that law under the current incentives to allow for it. So it is a theoretical discussion. Theoretical discussions are valuable. What 
what I want and what the people I wrote this book for want is what could we all do right now that would change the ability of Congress to deliver results now. And that is final five voting because Congress in Article One gives that power to the states to make it. And because of this feature of final five voting, which, which actually you guys have really gotten at and what you've discussed, which is if we did final five voting in four more states, we already have it in Alaska, we'd have 10 senators who would still be Democrats and Republicans but they would be free from that tyranny of the party primary. So they form sort of that fulcrum um, that can swing from side to side. They, they create a bench of people off of which can come the gang of four, the gang of six, the gang of eight. And that is um, possible with changing those rules in only, again, let's say four more states. And so, so that's where I would leave it, which is the achievability part is brutal in what it does to um to potentially very powerful ideas which is why i am uh down to final five voting which i think is at the sweet spot save some time for public questions because we have gotten uh literally dozens of them it's uh th thank you uh, audience out there watching because you have given us a bigger volume of questions than uh, we usually get from our audience. But before that, if I could take the moderator's privilege of pushing back against something that has not had any pushback yet, uh, namely the idea of a three-fifths vote for speaker. Um, I know that, uh, uh, you know, Getting the actual three-fifths is uh, likely to be a problem when the actual party uh, distribution is not very close to that. And many European systems have a fallback, which they can go back to the people. Uh, if there's a hung government, if uh, coalition talks fail, then they can go back and hold a new election and it's expensive and it seems uh, somewhat superfluous. And yet often they do break the deadlock by going back to the people even a matter of a couple of months uh, after the last election. We can't. Constitution says you're stuck with that composition of Congress for two years. What I would predict, and I wonder, I don't mean to get us too sidetracked, but um, since Congress has to do something before it can agree on a speaker, sometimes maybe there's a declaration of war, maybe the military budget is expiring, some emergency procedure will, will be put into process for pending electing the speaker, and then that will become the standard, even as emergency procedures have become the standard in so many other areas of governance. Uh, whatever the emergency procedure is that they allow to, to do things before they reach uh, a consensus on a speaker will turn out to be the new normal. Am, am I being too cynical? Uh, yeah, I'm not. Sure. I'm not sure you're being too cynical. I mean, I can certainly, I can certainly see that happening. Um, let 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 me say, I think that Catherine's, you know, achievability is a very good metric, and a lot of these things may not be achievable. However, um, I do want to give one alternative to the to the electoral vote problem, and that is something called the National Voter Compact. And that is, that is a, a program that it's be, has begun, a campaign that's begun, to where 15 states in the District of Columbia so far, representing 195 electoral college votes, have agreed to cast all their electoral college votes for the national winner of the, of the presidential election. Um, and when they get to, when, when the compact gets to 270. So when it gets to 270, they're going to change the way they cast their electoral college votes. Now, there may be a constitutional challenge to this, et cetera, but it is a way to get around this minority controlling the majority problem without having a constitutional convention and reopening the constitution, which I agree is, is just simply not going to happen. So there, there are different ways to do this because the states actually can decide themselves. There's nothing in the constitution that says that the electoral college votes need to be distributed according to um, winner take all, which is what most states, except for Nebraska and Maine, uh, do. 
So we already know that states can diverge from the winner take all in the electoral college and the voter compact is an interesting idea that's got some steam. They're at 195, they need to get to 270 and this would, uh, this would happen. Walter, could I uh, reply to that real quick? Yes, please, please do, because last week Andy wrote a piece for Cato um, that was a critique of the compact. So we have joined oh, issue. Okay, as well. good. <laughs> I'm sorry, well, I didn't see it. <laughs> but first, I just want to say um, I agree with you, and I've also written about this, that the minority rule problem is a real problem. Um, it fuels asymmetric polarization. I think it's why you've seen in some ways the GOP uh, get more extreme faster. So I'm not, um, unlike some of my colleagues, I'm not a huge defender of the Electoral College on the merits and the way it works. Um, but I think coming after what happened in 2020, and this is something that applies more generally to all these electoral reform ideas, um, we have to be very careful that we create a system where the rules are settled and clear and not in dispute and that we have a final outcome. Um, and so the, the, the problem with the national popular vote interstate compact is that there um, is no good way to have a definitive um, count. You know, we don't actually have a definitive sum of who the national popular vote. Um, states can do weird things about how they choose their electors uh, that would make it really easy for any one state to throw a monkey wrench in the system. Um, I would recommend anybody who's interested look into uh, the debate that's been running for you know 60 years now about who won the national popular vote in 1960 um, because Alabama did something weird with how it chose electors, produced a mixed slate, and depending on how you count that, um, Kennedy or Nixon won the national popular vote. So I, I do worry um, about being thrown into an election crisis, a constitutional crisis. Um, you know, it's a clever idea. But ultimately, I, I don't I don't know that there is there, there's not really a good workaround, I think, to a constitutional amendment there. And on uh, Catherine's point of achievability, I think I agree that's very important. Um, one point I would like to make about that, though, is that uh, our options are much more constrained at the federal level for what we can do for Congress and the presidency. Um, you know, the structure of the Senate is baked in. Um, even single member districts, even that's statutory, not constitutional, but it would be hard to change. Um, the electoral college, I don't think is going anywhere, but you do have a lot more freedom, uh, at the state level for what you can do for state legislatures. And I think there's a lot of potential there, um, for a broader range of ideas that can be passed by ballot initiative or potentially passed through the legislature itself. Um, I would like to see, you know, I mentioned the example of Nebraska earlier. I, I, I would really like to see, um, I think if you start at the state legislative level, it can bubble up from there. Um, you know, things that you try at that level and that work well and that are popular and prove good results, you can then build momentum for other states to adopt it and to push, you know, hopefully something similar at the federal level. Um, so I would, I would say, you know, don't, this discussion should not be just constrained to Congress and presidential elections. You know, we have half a million elected offices in this country um, and how we do things down ballot is, is important too. Well, that could make a good transition okay. to questions from our audience because- um, oh, Walter? In fact, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Walter, Catherine, I'm you respond and then I'll, I'll continue. I'm desperate too, yeah, thank you. Um, so to be a bit of a broken record, we won't pull it up again, um, but let's go to the second side of the Venn diagram, which is powerful. And why I'm bringing this up again is because my purpose in this work is that we as a country will, that enough of us will decide that we want final five voting. I mean, I'm definitely here selling that, you know? So here's what I'm gonna say, why did I choose it? Because believe me, I would choose something else in a heartbeat if I found something better to invest my you know life in so the reason um so now when we go to powerful i'll say two things strategy about choosing what not to do we focus on congress not the presidency because the president can make things worse but i don't believe right now there's any 
president that could make things so much better if you leave Congress under the current dysfunctional system where they can only do this or this. Think of your dream president and what they won't be able to get done is if Congress is in its current form. So if we could only fix one of our three branches, I would make it Congress because I'm, you know, it's the first branch of government. I'm a huge fan of that branch and they're just ceding their power to the other two branches here and there while they gridlock and grandstand. So for me, we can't do everything, fix Congress first. The second thing is federal. Um, we don't, in my view, have time to experiment too much at state legislatures because we're sort of going down. And here's how I summarize it. I told you what achievable was, here's how I think of powerful. We are in a much worse place than when I started this work in 2013, then it was to improve things, to solve problems. Now I think, and many of us, I you know, suspect many of you might agree that we're in an existential place. So I think of our country as like drowning under this much water. And the only things I wanna do in terms of powerful or wanna recommend that people do now are things that get the water to at least here so that we can breathe while we do all the other things. And changing state governments is fabulous and we need to do it, but we'll still be dead if we did that, which is why I'm willing to go for broke in a sense on final five voting, which is less achievable than changing some state governments, shall we say, but if we did it, we, the water would be at least here. So I say, I just wanna, I think we need to all decide to play some games worth losing. And then we should also then do state legislators and also do those things. But the sine qua, if I'm saying that right, non of political change is that Congress has got to be functional, ASAP. Okay, with, with that, let me introduce some of the themes of audience questions. and. I love our Cato audience. Uh, a lot of the questions are about incentives and a lot of the questions are about achievability, uh, the very same topics that we've been exploring. And for that reason, some of the questions have indeed been, been answered, but let me focus on a couple. Many people ask, given that incumbents incentives uh, in the various states and in Congress are against this, given the party's incentives and, and political um, support actors incentives, uh, how are you going to achieve it in that? leads to questions about um, what about direct democracy? We think of that debate as somehow having stalled. Uh, and yet, in this issue, just as with the redistricting issue that I'm involved with separately, uh, you wind up with two very different lists of states, states where progress seems to be possible because of direct democracy mechanisms, and states where progress seems sometimes to be almost impossible because they do not have strong initiative. Isn't that even more fundamental? Um, wouldn't the experience of states like Colorado and quite a, a few other Western ones suggest that that might be an even more uh, important place to start? Or are you ambivalent the way I'm ambivalent and, and, and many of us are ambivalent about the, the power of direct democracy to do both good and bad uh, in, in a very powerful way? Uh, I happen to think that I don't even need to once again debate whether uh, direct democracy is good or bad, meaning whether it's powerful good or powerful bad because it just is what it is. And it would be just as hard to change the rules for a direct democracy as it would be to change the final five voting in the states that already have it. So I just, there are so many questions that I don't even ask myself because if I knew the answers to them, since I couldn't make, make it be that way, it sort of doesn't help that I would have, know the answers to them. But that's a, I, sh I should more directly say, half the states have direct democracy, meaning initiatives and we can run final five voting initiatives in any of those states and that is where we won our first one and i say we i was fortunate to be associated with it but the uh victory goes to people in alaska uh led by a man named scott kendall who founded an initiative for final four voting the close cousin of final five voting and won that at the ballot box in november of 2020 and we will have more ballot initiatives in a number of those states on the ballot in 2022 and 2024 where the citizens can choose this one of the things i like about final five voting is 
as I said a moment ago, you really only need to pass it in a small number of states for it to be able to affect the results that Congress delivers. Because look, you can see what power uh, a Joe Manchin has. He's one senator. Imagine if you had 10, and I'm not going to say good power, bad power, let's just take that out of the equation for the moment. Imagine if you had 10 senators who were not only beholden to this side or that side, they're beholden to general elect electorates in their state. And even if there's a red state, you know, there's 30% Democrats in it and they now have, you know, options to um, create new coalitions for winning their next election. So that that is why, um, why we don't need to sort of answer that direct democracy question to decide whether we're going to move forward with final five voting and why we take, Andy, you brought up the laboratories of democracy. We can do it in those small number of states. And then if it really doesn't change what's happening in Congress, we can, you know, stop in a sense, but we'll be able to see the results very, very quickly. Other comments? Just uh, br briefly on, on the issue of ballot initiatives. Um, I, I'm a fan of ballot initiatives and referendums for electoral reform. Um, if you look at the states where progress has been made uh, in adopting something other than, you know, the traditional what we're used to first past the post system, um, most of it has been uh, through a ballot initiative. Uh, top two uh, in California and Washington, ranked choice voting in Maine, uh, the recent adoption of Final Four, ranked choice in Alaska. Um, so I think there's definitely a lot of a lot of good potential there. Um, but legislative, uh, there's some potential for legislative reform, too. Um, and you know, if we have the time to get to, it, I'd love to hear a little bit more from Catherine on what's been going on in Wisconsin. But I know that there's a bill there for Final Five. Wisconsin does not have initiative and referendum. Um, so the only way to get something done is to pass it through the legislature. Um, but in a state that is very polarized um, and has, you know, even by the standards of contemporary American politics, has a very toxic division in its politics between the two parties. Um, yeah, that's the first thing I've heard of in a long time that has bipartisan sponsors. So I think legislators, um, you know, they're not they're not bad people. They see the same problems we do. They live it every day. They know how dysfunctional the system is. Um, and it is possible to get them, get them on board with, you know, a good government reform, even if it might not be our ideal or won't go as far as we want or, or whatever. So um, def definitely it's, it's easier in states that have initiative to try to do it that way. But the legislative process is a, is a viable option in a lot of these states. Well, it's so viable. Look, this is fabulous for legislators. What these talented people who want to be in public service don't want to go to Washington D.C. and find that they're forbidden to do the things that they, you know, sort of forbidden by the incentives to do the things that that they, that they want to do. The foreword to my book was written by um, two veterans, uh, newer members of Congress, uh, Mike Gallagher, a Republican from Wisconsin, and Chrissy Houlihan, a Democrat from Pennsylvania. And they wrote the foreword together and they said, we went into the military to uh, serve our country, love of country. And then same love of country, we went to Congress. Why, when we got to Congress, are we no longer on the same for America team? when we're here for the same reasons, protecting, representing, serving the same people. And so they were talking about, you know, it doesn't have to be this way. We can come in with our differences and under a different system, different things could happen. And that's actually, veterans are one of our key support areas across the country. And certainly in Wisconsin, we have bipartisan sponsorship of this bill, which you mentioned, Andy. And uh, one thing that we always say to legislators, you know, it's not a job reduction bill. We have the exact same number of jobs and you can get them, you can still win. And then after you've won, you can have a life full of freedom and agency that you don't currently have. And where you go in state legislators is, uh, if there's one, you know, there's one thing people in this country agree on, I always say Congress is broken, but then a moment later I'll say, um, well, let's just stick with that, Congress is broken. And so state legislators also think Congress is broken. So when you go to state legislator, you don't ask them to change the rules on their own heads. You ask them to change these rules for the federal races and people can get behind that because 
Republicans and Democrats across the country agree that Congress is broken. We, we've only got another minute or two, so I'm going to um, ask us to wrap up. I wish we could get to questions that, again, our Cato audience is actually asking for more innovation. Oh, there's no time to discuss term limits, but several questions were, uh, wouldn't that directly address the incentive problems? Uh, there were questions about uh, is Final Four voting okay? And I take it from a footnote in your book, Catherine, that Final Four voting still preserves the principle and would be okay. But also about open primaries. And much was promised for open primaries. Why hasn't that worked out as a reform idea? Uh, again, no time to get into any depth on these, but are there ideas that any of you would like to close on before we go? Okay. Um, I think we've all, Andy, go ahead, yes. Oh, I, I was just going to um, reiterate a, a point Catherine made about the urgency uh, of this issue. Um, we saw uh, earlier this year uh, here in D.C. kind of the worst case end result outcome that you can get from the division of a runaway death spiral of two-party polarization. Um, and there's a real danger of the system cracking in ways that, you know, we're used to thinking can't happen here, but it can happen here. Um, and I, I think electoral reform and creating ways to get around the incentives that have led us to that place um, is possibly the, you know, most important big picture issue we're going to face in this country over the next uh, decade or two. Um, so I, I commend the book and, and all the good work you're, you're doing to, to get us there and, and push this proposal. Yes, it's just I'd like, a pleasure I'd like to, to second that. I'd like to Talking second to that. You guys about primaries, you. incentives, we're, we're all on the same page about that. And it's, you know, we, we're all in love with our country. So it's, it's great to be uh, in a community of people working on these things. So let's... Uh, Come to the election watch party on November in 2022 to see if we win our final five voting initiatives in Chicago. <laughs> yes. Something to look forward to. And I thank all of our panelists for a uh, very stimulating and productive discussion. I thank our audience for uh, turning out in large numbers and asking excellent questions. Um, please watch for more Cato Book Forums and join me in thanking our panel. Thank you, Walter. <laughs>